Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the entire Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. Today, we're going to be diving straight into the most important event leading up to the Pacific War, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. Now, if you're not already done so, please hit that like and subscribe button as it would mean a lot to this small channel. And as you can see, I have two very hungry birds to feed. A shaky relationship between Russia and Japan began brewing during the mid-19th century. The Russian Empire acquired Vladivostok from the Qing Dynasty after the Second Opium War with the Convention of Peking, and this led them to expand their maritime trade in the Pacific. On March 13, 1861, the Russian Empire attempted to establish a year-round anchorage on the coast of Tsushima Island. This led to a clash between Russian sailors and the local Japanese, leading Russia to back off. Russia would go on to begin building the Trans-Siberian Railway, linking up Vladivostok in the 1890s. Alongside this, Russia began consolidating its influence in the region of Manchuria, pressing closer to Korea. After the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895, Japan was forced to give up its acquisition of the Liandong Peninsula by the triple intervention of Germany, France, and Russia. The rise of Japan provoked Russia's anxiety, and she desperately sought a warm water port, having only the port of Vladivostok in the Pacific. Russia was leased Port Arthur in 1897 and occupied the Liandong Peninsula, beginning to build up Port Arthur's fortress, where it would base its Pacific fleet. While this move was primarily intended to counter Britain's occupation of Wei Highway, it was also directly perceived as a threat to Japan. To link up its new acquisition, Russia built the Chinese Eastern Railway from the Trans-Siberian going through Manchuria. During the Boxer Rebellion, both Russia and Japan contributed troops to the eight-nation alliance that quelled the rebellion. While all four nations won certain concessions, Russia had sent 177,000 soldiers into Manchuria under the guise to protect its railway construction. Once the rebellion was over, 100,000 of these soldiers remained stationed in Manchuria despite assurances they would vacate once the crisis was finished. Russia's encroachment threatened Japan, but Japan felt it was too militarily weak at this time to evict the Russians from Manchuria. Japan signed the Anglo Alliance in 1902 with Britain, seeking to restrict Russia's naval capabilities at Port Arthur and Vladivostok. Their alliance meant that if any nation allied itself to Russia during the war with Japan, Britain would enter on Japan's side. In the 1890s, Emperor Wilhelm II sought to change the balance of power in Europe to Germany's benefit. Wilhelm II began a propaganda campaign known as the Yellow Peril, which proclaimed a pan-Asian alliance emerging that would threaten all of Europe. He sent letters to his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, praising him as the savior of the white race, and God himself chose the Tsar to defend Europe against the Asian threat. In reality, Wilhelm II was simply manipulating his cousin to go to war with Japan. Germany's goal was to challenge Britain's world-leading position, and since Britain was allied to Japan, Germany sought to have Russia go to war with Japan, which could result in a Russian-German alliance against Britain. Now, Russia had made assurances its forces in Manchuria would leave by April the 8th, 1903, but the day passed with no reduction. Japan, seeking to stabilize relations with Russia, had Prime Minister Ito Hirobumi begin negotiations on August the 3rd, 1903. He sent Russia a document advocating for a deal. Japan would cede control of Manchuria to Russia if Russia ceded control of Korea to Japan. Russia sent a response on October the 3rd, 1903, refusing Japan's offer and demanding that Korea's 39th parallel serve as a neutral zone. Negotiations would continue into 1904, but went nowhere. It was actually Wilhelm II continuously sending letters, egging Nicholas II on, imploring Russia to annex all of Korea, Manchuria, and northern China, and making it seem Germany would back them up. Japan saw that Russia was intentionally prolonging negotiations while building up its naval forces in the Pacific, and decided enough was enough. The Russia Pacific Fleet had two forces, one at Port Arthur, the other at Vladivostok. The beginning of the war would see the two nations fight at Port Arthur. The IRN Pacific Fleet at Port Arthur consisted of seven battleships, six cruisers, commanded overall by Admiral Oskar Ludwig Stark. The IJN combined fleet consisted of six battleships, nine armored cruisers, 15 destroyers, and 20 torpedo boats, commanded overall by Admiral Togo Hihachiro. Admiral Togo's plan was a preemptive strike against the Russian's navy at Port Arthur. At 10.30 p.m. on February 8, 1904, a IJN squadron of 10 destroyers was sent out to attack the ships at Port Arthur. At 12.28 a.m., the first four IJN destroyers arrived, launching torpedoes and hitting battleships Palada and Retsivizan. Palada was hit amidship, causing a fire and keeling over, while Retsivizan was hit in her bow. The next destroyers to arrive launched torpedoes at protected cruiser Tsertsevich, disabling her. After this, the Russians were fully awake and could fire using their shore batteries, so the Japanese withdrew. Convinced the IRN was paralyzed from the night attack, 
The IJN approached Port Arthur the next day, and at 12 p.m., at a range of 5 miles, the IJN fired their 12-inch guns on the shore batteries and their 8- and 6-inch guns on the IRN. IRNs Novik, Petropavlovsk, Poltava, Diana, and Askold were severely damaged, but the IRN was not paralyzed and within minutes began firing at Mikasa, killing a few of her crew. After 20 minutes of combat, Admiral Togo turned the fleet away, not wanting to risk the full brunt of the Russian shore batteries and IRN guns. As the IGN pulled out, they exchanged fire with the IRN, and both sides scored hits, seven on the Japanese and five on the Russians. The Russians took 150 casualties and the Japanese took 90, with no ships sunk on either side, but several taking damage. Japan issued a formal declaration of war on February the 10th, 1904, a day after the surprise attack, similar to what would occur at Pearl Harbor in 1941. Port Arthur was effectively under a blockade. On February the 11th, the Russians began to deploy mines at the entrance of Port Arthur, and the Japanese would do the same. And on March the 8th, Admiral Stefan Makarov arrived at Port Arthur to relieve the command of Admiral Stark, who was sacked. On March the 10th, the IRN took to the offensive, coming out of the port to attack the IGN blockade, but with little effect. Later that day, the IGN sent four destroyers close to Port Arthur to lure the IRN out again. The Russians took the bait and sent six destroyers. Two of the IRN destroyers ran into Japanese mines, and both were sunk. On April 13th, Makarov transferred his flag to battleship Petropavlovsk and attempted to assist a destroyer recon patrol near Dalian. His squadron soon met the IGN and had to retreat back to Port Arthur under the protection of its shore batteries. However, on the way back, at 9.43, Petropavlovsk was struck by three Japanese mines and sank in two minutes. This disaster killed 335 of her crew, including Admiral Makarov. Battleship Pobida also hit a mine and was crippled. Admiral Togo ordered the IGN flags to be flown at half-mast in respect of Admiral Makarov's death. Admiral Vilgem Vidjeft would command at Port Arthur. On May 15th, IGN battleships Yashima and Hatsuze ran into mines at Port Arthur, both sinking as a result. Admiral Vilgem Vidjeft of the IRN tried to break out of the blockade on August the 10th to make a sortie to Vladivostok. Now the IGN had split up their fleet, sending a few ships to support ground forces entering the Liaodong Peninsula. At 9.55 a.m., the IRN broke out, feigning southwest to conceal their movements. Togo's forces scrambled to get into formation as they sailed parallel to the IRN. The IGN used their speed to get their cruisers to cross the IRNT at 12.25 near Encounter Rock, and began opening fire at a range of 8 miles. The IRN quickly turned and tried to break for open sea, but the IGN kept moving parallel to them, exchanging fire and hitting Ret Vizan over 12 times. The IRN proceeded to make maneuvers to get around the IGN, who kept crossing their T as both fleets exchanged fire. Eventually, the IRN had to give up, retreating back to Port Arthur. The Russians had 226 casualties, Japanese 340. Both sides had several ships damaged, but none sunk. The first major land battle was the Battle of Yalu River, fought near Riju. The Imperial Russian Army commander in the Far East, General Alexei Kuropatkin, took a stalling strategy. The Russians were stalling to allow reinforcements to come via the Trans-Siberian Railway and take the offensive. However, the railway was incomplete, making the trip a long ordeal. Kudopatkin dispatched an eastern detachment commanded by Lieutenant General Mikhail Zuzelich with 16,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and 62 artillery pieces. The IGA deployed the first army commanded by Major General Bron Tememoto Kuroki, consisting of 42,500 men coming from Chumupo. They reached the Yalu River on the night of April 24, 1904, crossing the river using pontoon bridges at multiple points, making a three-pronged advance. At 5 a.m. on April the 29th, the IGA artillery opened fire, knocking out the IRA artillery, while they advanced on the town of Iju, and then they pincer attacked the IRA at Chulianchong. By 10 a.m., the IRA was in full retreat, slowly making their way north to Fenghongsheng. The Japanese had 1,036 casualties, the Russian 2,700. The Japanese Second Army, consisting of 38,500 men, commanded by General Yasukata Oku, landed on the Liodong Peninsula on May the 5th, 1904. Their mission was to capture Port Dalian and lay siege to Port Arthur. To protect the way to Port Arthur and Dalian, commander of the IRA in the Kwangtung Peninsula, General Baron Anatoly Stiesel, fortified Nanshin Hill. 17,000 men, 114 pieces of artillery, mines, Maxim machine guns, and a network of trenches and barbed wire were the hill's defense. On May 26, the IJ began its assault on the entrenched Russians at Nanshin Hill, with an artillery barrage from the Japanese gunboats offshore. The IJ made nine attempts to overrun the Russian positions, failing and taking heavy casualties. The Russian reserve regiments then suddenly retreated after blowing up their own ammunition reserves under orders of General Falk. Falk was paranoid of a possible Japanese landing behind their position and panicked. Neglecting to tell the main commander at Nanshan, Tretyakov, before fleeing with his men, leaving Tretyakov in a position vulnerable of being encircled with no ammunition and no reserve force. Tretyakov had no choice but to fall back to the defensive lines at Port Arthur, and the IGA captured Nanshan Hill. The Russians had 1,400 casualties, while the Japanese suffered over 6,198. 
On May the 30th, to their amazement, Port Dalian was left defenseless, so the IGA occupied it with ease. After losing Nanshan Hill and Dalian, the Russians feared being encircled at Port Arthur. Lieutenant General Georgi Stackelberg was ordered to mount an offensive from Lianyang in the direction of Port Arthur. He had 27,000 infantry, 2,500 cavalry, and 98 artillery pieces. The IGA at Dalian reorganized into the 2nd Army under General Oku, who would march north towards Lianyang, and the 3rd Army under General Baron Nogi Marosuke, who would lay siege to Port Arthur. The 2nd IGA Army had 36,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, 216 artillery pieces as it marched towards Lianyang. On June 14th, the 2nd IGA ran into the IRA at the village of Telosu, and the Russians had already set up their field artillery on high grounds. However, the IGA artillery outperformed the new Russian Putelov M1903 field guns, mostly because the crews lacked training with the new equipment. On top of losing the artillery battle, the Russians were outflanked by faint maneuvers, and to avoid encirclement, Stackelberg issued orders to retreat at 11.30am on June the 15th. The Russians fought bitterly as they ran to their trains, rushing away to Mukden. The Russians had 3,500 casualties, and the Japanese 1,163. After the Battle of Telusu, the 2nd IGA rested a few days to gather reinforcements, becoming 64,000 men strong, with 252 artillery pieces. Lieutenant General Stackelberg's forces dug in at Keiping, and Lieutenant General Nikolai Zurobev's forces were entrenched in the town of Teshishiao. Overall, they were 60,000 men strong. The 2nd IGA marched north and reached the area on July the 24th, when at 5.30 a.m. they began an artillery duel. The Russian artillery caused heavy casualties thwarting a Japanese assault. The Japanese made a night attack at 10 p.m. on the Russian left flank and overran them. This was followed up by another assault at 3 a.m., targeting key hills where Russian artillery was. The IGA artillery bombarded the hills until no return fire was made. By 1 p.m., the IGA occupied Tshishiao, as Stackelberg had withdrew during the first night attack. It is estimated that both sides lost around 1,000 casualties each. The longest and most violent offensive came with the assault of Port Arthur. Major General Anatoly Stiesel commanded 50,000 troops, 44,000 civilian volunteers, and 506 artillery pieces to protect a population of 87,000 at Port Arthur. The defenses consisted of multi-perimeter layouts with overlapping fields of fire. On the other defense was a line of hills. Hisiao Kyushan, Takushan, Namakoyama, Akasakayama, 174 meter hill, 203 meter hill, and False Hill. All the hills were heavily fortified, and around 1.5 kilometers behind the defensive lines was a Chinese stone wall encircling the town. The Russians had howitzers, Maxim machine guns, bolt-action magazine rifles, barbed wire, electric fences, searchlights, hand grenades, and tactical radio signaling, making this a very World War I-esque battle. The 3rd IGA, commanded by General Baron Nogi Maratsuke, was 150,000 men strong, with over 474 artillery pieces. The IGA began bombarding with 4.7 inch artillery beginning on August the 7th to August the 19th, 1904. The IGN also bombarded the less fortified hills of Takushan and Huzio Kushan. The IGA pounded the hills from 4.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., then launched a frontal assault through parts of the Ta River. Many men drowned in the process. They attacked throughout the night while Russian searchlights exposed them to artillery attack and machine gun fire. Undeterred, the IGA attacked the next day with the IRN fleet bombarding them. The Russians held on tenaciously, but the IGA were finally able to overrun their positions via sheer numbers, capturing Takushan at 10 p.m. and Huzio Kushan on the following morning. The two hills cost the IGA 1,280 casualties. On August 19th, the IGA thrusted at 174 meter hill, being defended by Tretyakov's forces. The Russians fought bitterly, losing half of their men before withdrawing the next day. Taking the hill cost the IGA 1,800 casualties and the IRA 1,000. The IGA attempted to penetrate the Wantai Ravine on August 24th, but by this time they mounted over 16,000 casualties. Thus, General Nogi decided to abandon the frontal assaults in favor of a protracted siege. Nogi ordered his men to dig trenches and tunnel underneath the Russian forts so they could explode mines, bringing down the walls. Nogi also received 16,000 reinforcements and 11-inch Armstrong siege howitzers, which could throw 500-pound shells over 5.6 miles. Meanwhile, the defenders began to suffer from an outbreak of scurvy and dysentery due to a lack of fresh food. On September the 19th, the IGA assaulted and captured the Waterworks Redoubt and the Temple Redoubt. Another IGA force captured Namakoyama Hill on the same day while IGA forces attacked 203 meter hill, which met extreme machine gun fire. The IGA fought for days, gaining footholds only to be counterattacked each time. Nogi had to abandon taking the hill once casualties mounted up to 3,500, and then the Russians began to reinforce the hill. On October the 29th, Nogi ordered a human wave attack on the hill, but the attack failed after six days of brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, amounting to almost 3,611 casualties. 203 meter hill was at the highest elevation within Port Arthur, overlooking the harbor. 
the IGA required the hill to be able to bombard the IRN fleet within the harbor, Nogi was going to be replaced if he failed to capture it. On September the 20th, the IGA assaulted it again and after two days had 2,500 casualties. This was followed up by a six-day general assault on fortifications around Port Arthur, costing the IGA a further 3,600 casualties. Popular opinion of Noki was dropping dramatically, pushing him to take drastic actions, or he will be relieved of command. Meanwhile, Tsar Nicholas II, under pressure to save the Pacific Fleet, formed a 2nd and 3rd Pacific Squadron to make an incredible journey all the way to Port Arthur from the Baltic and Black Sea. These Pacific Squadrons consisted of these ships and were commanded by Admiral Rosthetvensky and Rear Admiral von Falkosam. The warships would debark from the Baltic ports of Rival in mid-October in Leba and the Black Sea, port of Odessa, on November the 3rd, 1904. By mid-November, some of the 2nd Pacific Squadron entered the Indian Ocean. Back at Port Arthur on November the 26th, Nogi ordered mines to be exploded under the Russian fortifications and performed a forlorn hope attack on Fort Herlung and Fort saint but were beaten back. The IGA suffered 4,000 casualties with these frontal assaults. This was followed up two days later with a massive artillery bombardment and the IGA assaults on Akasakayama and 203 meter hill. Over 1,000 shells were used in a single day to support the assault. By November the 30th, an IJ force planted the Japanese flag at the summit of 203 meter hill, but by the morning of December the 1st, the Russians successfully counterattacked. For days, hand to hand combat raged over the summit until December the 5th at 10.30 a.m., Tretyakov was severely wounded by artillery. The IGA managed to overrun his disoriented forces with only a handful of defenders left alive on the summit. The Russians launched two counterattacks, but both failed. By 5 p.m., 203 meter hill was under Japanese control. The ordeal cost the IGA 8,000 casualties and the Russians over 6,000. With a spotter and a phone line connected to the vantage point on 203 meter hill, Nogi began to bombard the IRN fleet with 11 inch howitzers. On December the 5th, battleship Poltava was sunk, Ret Vizan by December the 7th, and Pobida, Pervets, Palada, and Bayan by December the 9th. Sevastopol managed to maneuver out of range, so Admiral Togo sent destroyers in, firing over 124 torpedoes, yet she still managed to float. The IGN lost two destroyers and the cruiser Takasago to a mine in the process. On the night of January the 2nd, 1905, Captain Nikolai Essen of Sevastopol tried to scuttle the ship, but even that failed, and eventually the Japanese salvaged the warship, recommissioning it for the IGN. The IGA pressed its tunnel warfare and on December the 18th detonated a near 4,000 pound mine under Fort Chikan, which promptly fell that night. On December 28th, similar mines were detonated under Fort Irlung, destroying it. On December the 31st, a series of mines detonated under the last fort, Songshu. It surrendered that day. And on January the 1st, Wantai fell to the IGA and Stoisil surrendered to Nogi on January the 5th, 1905. The Russian soldiers were taken into captivity, the civilians disallowed to leave. Overall, the Russians suffered 31,306 casualties, with at least 6,000 killed. The IGA suffered 57,780 casualties, with over 14,000 killed. Over 33,769 IGA members had become sick during the siege, mostly because of beriberi. Nogi would later go on to apologize for the lives lost during the campaign to Emperor Meiji, asking him to be allowed to kill himself in atonement. Instead, Emperor Meiji ordered him to live out the rest of his life. After leaving a garrison in Port Arthur, Nogi left with the bulk of his surviving army, almost 120,000 of them, to join Marshal Oyama to attack Mukden. While the siege of Port Arthur had been raging, the IGA won various battles such as the Battle of Hushmicheng on July the 31st and a minor naval battle at Ulsan on August the 14th, 1904. The next major battle would take place at Liaoyang, which stood on the Russian South Manchurian Railway connecting Port Arthur to Bukden. The city was heavily fortified with three lines of fortifications. General Alexei Kuropatkin commanded 158,000 men with 609 artillery pieces, dividing his forces into three groups. General Oyama Iowa divided his forces consisting of the 1st, 2nd, and 4th IGA, consisting of over 120,000 men and 170 artillery pieces, all converging on Liaoyang. The 2nd IGA would advance along the railway, while the 1st would converge on Motian Pass, and the 4th would be in reserve. Because of the lack of numbers, Oyama was hoping the 3rd IGA of General Nogi would join once Port Arthur was secured, but it took too long, pressing Oyama to attack. On August the 25th, 1904, the IGA began artillery bombarding as they assaulted the right flank of the IRA. The Russian artillery thwarted the attack, forcing the IGA to take up to a thousand casualties. Then the IGA assaulted the east of Liaoyang in fierce night fighting on top of the slopes of Pico Mountain, taking the position the following day. By August the 27th, the IRA pulled back from the outer defensive lines to the second defensive lines. While these lines were easier to defend, they also allowed Oyama to encircle them easier by cutting off the railway. 
On August the 30th, the IGA assaulted multiple defensive fronts, but were repulsed. To the surprise of the Japanese, Kuropatkin made no counterattacks. It turns out Kuropatkin was under the belief the Japanese forces were much larger than they actually were, and he decided to hold back. On September the 1st, the 2nd IGA took Karn Hill, while the 1st IGA crossed the Tetsu River around 8 miles east of the Russian lines. This prompted Kuropatkin to pull back to the innermost defensive lines, enabling the IGA to artillery bombard the city and its railway station. Finally, knowing their plight, Kuropatkin ordered a counterattack aimed at the 1st IGA crossing the Tetsu River towards Manjuyama Hill, east of the city. Kuropatkin set the 1st and 10th Siberian Army Corps with 13 battalions. They made a night attack on the hill, initially being successful, but then in confusion the Russian regiments fired upon another, and by the morning the IGA took back the hill. By September the 3rd, the counterattack was cancelled as Kuropatkin decided to abandon the city and regroup at Mukden, fearing encirclement. The IGA suffered up to 23,615 casualties and 15,548 for the IRA. After the Battle of Liaoyang, General Kuropatkin planned to block the Japanese advance at Xiaohou River, south of Mukden. His forces numbered 210,000, while Oyama's force was 170,000. The IRA broke into a western detachment commanded by General Alexander von Bilderling, an eastern detachment commanded by Lieutenant General Georgi Stackelberg, and some reserves. From October the 5th to the 17th, the IGA and the IRA attempted to outflank another, inflicting heavy casualties on both sides. The end result was a gradual retreat from the IRA to Mukden while the IGA had advanced 25 kilometers. The Russians suffered 41,350 casualties and the Japanese 20,345. While it was a tactical victory for the Japanese, they were unable to advance any further, having their supply lines grown too thin, so they had to dig in. After the Battle of Xiao, both sides had dug in, hoping for reinforcements to arrive. On January the 19th, 1905, Kuropatkin ordered the 2nd Manchurian Army, consisting of 75,000 men, commanded by General Oskar Gripenberg, to attack the 2nd IGA Army, consisting of 40,000 men, commanded by General Oku. The plan was to push the 2nd IGA back across the Tatsu River, before the 3rd IGA, commanded by Nogi, would arrive. On January the 25th, many of the IRA attacked the IGA at the fortified village of Heikote, under heavy blizzard conditions. The original plan was to attack Sendepu village, but many of the IRA had become lost. The IGA at Sendepu artillery bombarded the IRA as they continued their divided assault. The incoherent assault continued despite heavy losses until January the 29th when Oyama launched a massive counterattack taking Heikote by mid-morning. Gribenberg claimed illness and resigned as the IGA pushed the IRA back. Overall, the Russians suffered up to 20,000 casualties and the Japanese lost 9,000. The last and most decisive land battle would occur at Mukden. General Kiropatkin had 340,000 men, 1,219 artillery pieces, and 88 machine guns. His defensive force consisted of the 1st Manchurian Army under General Nikolai Leinvich, the 2nd under General Baron von Wolfsbach, and the 3rd under General Baron von Biedeling. Oyama's force was 270,000 strong, with 992 artillery and 200 machine guns, consisting of the 1st Army under General Kiryoki, the second under General Oku, third under General Nogi, and the fourth under General Nozu, and a newly formed fifth army under General Kawamura. Ayoma's strategy was to form his armies into a crescent and encircle Mukden, cutting off their escape. He also gave explicit orders to not combat within the city of Mukden to avoid civilian casualties. The battle opened up with the 5th IGA attacking the left flank of the IRA on February the 20th, 1905. On the 27th, the 4th IGA attacked the right flank, while the 3rd IGA circled around northwest of Mukden, and the other IGA forces attacked the IRA front lines. By March the 7th, General Kuropatkin began withdrawing forces from his eastern front to counter the 3rd IGA, who were trying to attack the western flank of Mukden. General Kuropatkin led the east to west forces himself, and this resulted in an uncoordinated mess, leading the 1st and 3rd Manchurian armies to disintegrate into chaos. General Kuropatkin withdrew his troops north towards Mukden to face the IGA head-on at the Hun River, just southeast of the city. Oyama seized the opportunity and ordered an attack on the Hun River. The IGA fought bitterly through artillery fire, but eventually took the northern bank of the river. The Russian forces were now divided, and the IGA were capable of encircling their right flank. General Kuropatkin ordered a retreat north on March the 9th, but this quickly turned into a disorganized route. The panicked Russians abandoned their wounded, weapons, and supplies fleeing towards Tiling. By 10 a.m. on March the 10th, the IGA occupied Mukden. The Russians had 90,000 casualties, losing most of their artillery and machine guns while fleeing. The IGA suffered 75,000 casualties. The Russians were driven out of southern Manchuria. The Trans-Siberian Railroad was in the hands of the Japanese, and Russian morale was all but gone. The victory shocked the imperial powers of Europe, and particularly Tsar Nicholas II. 
While the war over the land was finishing, a decisive battle for the sea would occur in the Tushima Strait. Since the IGN began its attack on the IRN at Port Arthur, the 2nd and 3rd Pacific Squadron had made an incredible journey from the Baltic and Black Seas to come join up with the 1st Pacific Fleet in an attempt to overwhelm the IGN. However, by the time the 2nd and 3rd Pacific Squadrons had reached Nosi to Madagascar, Port Arthur had fallen. The new objective was to link up with the remaining war vessels at Vladivostok before challenging the IGN. The IRN would sail through Tushima Strait to get to Vladivostok. Admiral Togo, based in Masan, waited for the IRN to approach. The IRN, as a result of its 18,000-mile journey, was in poor condition for battle. The lack of opportunity for maintenance significantly reduced the speed of their warships. The IRN at this point was capable of 14 knots in short bursts, while the IGN could sustain 15 knots. The IRN consisted of 11 battleships, 9 cruisers, 9 destroyers, under the overall command of Vice Admiral Zinovi Rohesvensky. The combined IGN consisted of 5 battleships, 23 cruisers, 20 destroyers, and 16 torpedo boats under the overall command of Admiral Hihachiro Togo. On May the 26th, the IRN attempted to slip through the strait without being noticed under a heavy night fog. However, during the night, one of their hospital ships had their lights on, and the IGN cruiser Shinano Maru saw it while patrolling the strait. This led the Shinano Maru to discover the IRN fleet, and it sent out a wireless telegram message to Admiral Togo, who promptly prepared the IGN for battle. The IGN put out to sea, hunting the IRN while coordinating using wireless telegrams through poor weather conditions. At 1.40 p.m. on May the 27th, both fleets saw each other, and at 1.55 p.m. Togo hoisted the Z flag, issuing the predetermined announcement to the entire IGN Navy that the fate of the Empire was depending on this battle. The IGN intercepted the IRN and chased parallel to them, trying to maneuver around the IRN to cross their T, as the IRN opened fire, concentrating on the leading flagship, Mikasa. The Mikasa was hit over 30 times during this, but by 2.45 p.m., the IGN had successfully crossed the IRN's T. The IRN could only move at burst speeds of 14 knots, which allowed the faster IGN pushing 50 knots to successfully cross their T with ease. Now having crossed the T, the IGN opened fire using all broadside guns, as the IRN could only reply with their forward turrets. Shells poured over the IRN, tearing superstructures apart, ripping open steel plates, and sending fragments all over the decks, piling up the dead and dismembered across them. In 90 minutes, the leading IRN battleship Ocelibia was the first to sink, and this was also the first modern armored warship to be sunk by gunfire alone in history. Rolshovensky responded by attempting to alter the IRN's course eastward, with Imperator Alexander III taking lead. The IGN attempted to push the IRN south, but the IRN eventually managed a northern course again. The IGN got close to about 1,500 meters and managed to cross the IRN-T again, opening fire and hitting the Imperator Alexander III, capsizing her. Next, IGN battleship Fuji fired a hit into the magazine of IRN battleship Borodino, causing her to explode, sending smoke thousands of meters high into the air as she sank. IRN Pinats Suvarov was hit by torpedoes and sunk slowly. Rosavensky was knocked out of action by a shell fragment hitting his skull, and Rear Admiral Nikobogatov took command. At 8 p.m., Togo ordered 21 destroyers and 37 torpedo boats to attack the remaining RN warships from the east and south. For three hours, without break, they repeatedly attacked, colliding often with the RN warships. During the chaos, the RN dispersed into small groups trying to break northwards under the cover of darkness. By 11 p.m., it seemed the remaining IRN had escaped when they turned on their searchlights, giving away their location. IRN Navarin struck a mine and was forced into a halt, where IGN torpedo boats launched torpedoes at her, making four hits and sinking her. The IRN battleship Sisoy Velenki was hit by a torpedo on the stern and would be scuttled the next day. Two older armored cruisers, Admiral Nakimov and Vladimir Monomake, were both hit with torpedoes to the bow, taking on water and eventually scuttled. Togo ordered his torpedo boat destroyers to hunt any remaining vessels fleeing while he consolidated his heavy warships. At 9.30 a.m. on the 28th, the remaining IRN was sighted heading northwards. The IGN battleships surrounded the surviving IRN south of Takeshima Island and began firing main batteries at 12,000 meters, which was 1,000 meters outside of the IRN gun range. Vice Admiral Nibogatov realized the situation and hoisted the XGE International Signal of Surrender, but did not stop his engines, which violated the code. The IGN continued to fire upon them, thinking the IRN was faking a surrender and trying to flee. Nibogatov panicked and ordered the Japanese Navy flag hoisted up and stopped all engines. Togo finally gave the order to cease fire and accepted the surrender. In total, the Russians had 216 officers and over 4,614 men killed, with 278 and 5,629 men taken as POWs. The Russian cruiser Almaz and two torpedo boat destroyers Gorzny and Bravi made it to Vladivostok. 
saving 62 officers and over 1,165 men. The Japanese lost 117 officers and men killed, with 583 wounded. This battle effectively ended the war, completely humiliating Russia and shocked the entire world. Japan had only lost three torpedo boats. A prolonged war would not favor Japan, as they had overextended their supply lines and Russia could still send forces over the Trans-Siberian Railway, albeit slowly. Neither Russia nor Japan had prepared for the number of deaths that would occur in this new kind of warfare, nor did they have the finances to compensate the losses. Recognizing this, Japan sought intermediaries to assist in bringing the war to a negotiated conclusion. U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt initially was pro-Japanese when the war began, but soon saw the strengthening military power of Japan as a long-term threat to U.S. interests in Asia. Roosevelt met with Japanese diplomat Keneko Kentaro to set up negotiations which would take place in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The Portsmouth Peace Conference was led by Foreign Minister Komura Jutaro from Japan and the former Finance Minister Sergei Witt from Russia. Tsar Nicholas II told his delegates beforehand not to agree to any territorial concessions, reparations, or limitations on the deployment of Russian forces in the Far East. The Japanese came to the table demanding recognition of its interest in Korea, the removal of all Russian forces within Manchuria, substantial reparations, and to confirm their control over the Sakhalin Island that they had seized in 1905 just after the Battle of Tsushima. Twelve sessions were to be held between August the 9th to the 30th. Both sides were able to agree to eight points, an immediate ceasefire, recognition of Japanese claims over Korea, the evacuation of Russian forces within Manchuria, Russia ceasing its lease over Port Arthur and Dalian to Japan and turn over the South Manchurian Railway and some mining concessions over to Japan. Also, Russia was allowed to retain the Chinese Eastern Railway. However, reparations and territorial concessions were still being argued. On August the 18th, Roosevelt proposed that Russia divide Sakhalin with Japan. Komuro rejected this proposal, and Sergei Witt responded that he was instructed to cease negotiations and resume the war. Indeed, four new Russian divisions arrived in Manchuria, and the Russian delegation made a show of packing their bags and preparing to depart. The American host convinced the Japanese that monetary compensations was not open for compromise by the Russians. Komura yielded, taking the southern half of Sakhalin and dropping the claims for reparations. The Treaty of Portsmouth was signed on September the 5th and ratified on October the 10th, 1905. In 1906, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Theodore Roosevelt for negotiating the peace between Russia and Japan. However, the Japanese public were deeply dissatisfied with the terms of the treaty and this caused the Haibaya riots and the collapse of Prime Minister Katsura Taro's cabinet on January 7, 1906. Public outcry began in Russia since the Japanese attack on Port Arthur in 1904, and this all led to the Russian Revolution of 1905, straining the very fragile reign of Tsar Nicholas II. The treaty confirmed Japan's emergence as a power in Asia, and Japan learned the lesson that war pays high dividends and was an effective way to solve diplomatic problems. The United States was widely blamed in Japan for the treaty and that Roosevelt had cheated Japan out of its rightful claims. U.S.-Japanese relations would never be the same and would only worsen by the 1930s, eclipsing into war in 1941. <laughs> Now let's just summarize everything we have learned. The two empires of Russia and Japan fought a war over the sphere of influence over Asia. Japan won the war and shocked the entire world, emerging as a great power in Asia. Victory would be bittersweet as Japan felt it was robbed by the United States. U.S. and Japanese relations would only get worse from this point on, leading to war. We hope you like this episode. And it was narrated quite fast, and I do apologize for that. I tried to fit a lot into this one. But please, join us next time for the Xinhai Revolution, and please, like and subscribe so I can feed these poor little birds. This has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.